All right, it looks like it is 12 o'clock Central Standard Time here in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us to, today for this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Jeremiah DeGullen, and I am a Solutions Advisor for the Center for Professional and Executive Development. And I'm excited to join you today and uh, as we hear from Dr. Adam Bach about artificial intelligence as it relates to your organization's business strategy. Before I introduce Dr. Bach, I'd like to just share a few words about the Wisconsin School of Business Center for Professional and Executive Development, or as we affectionately refer to as CPED. So uh, with uh, our organization, C uh, the Center for Professional and Executive Development, we provide programs and certificates that will give you the modern relevant skills needed to advance your career. All of our programs offer interactive live learning sessions facilitated by instructors with practical business experience. CPED also partners with organizations to provide customized professional development programs, coaching, and consulting. For more information on CPED, please visit our website at www.uwcped.org. If you do have any questions during today's webinar, um, please submit those using the question uh, box at the bottom of your screen or the chat uh, section um, that's located at the bottom of your Zoom webinar screen. Uh, we'll post questions that are submitted during the Q&A, uh, during a Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. I also want to mention that today's webinar is being recorded, so a link to the recording will be made available within the coming days. Now, I'd like to hand things over to you, Adam. Uh, thanks for joining us. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeremiah, for getting us started off. I'm very excited to be here. I think we're going to have a little bit of fun, hopefully learn a little bit about AI and business strategy. Um, this isn't going to be a deep dive into the technical aspects of coding or anything like that. This is really about understanding the relevance of Gen AI uh, in the context of business strategy for organizations of all kinds. So before I even tell you a little bit about myself, which I will do in a moment, and where we're going with this, let's do a quick poll. Um, and I really would love if you would participate. This is anonymous. We don't track who you are or what you respond. We just want to get an idea of sort of the situation that you're currently in and how you're using Gen AI. And by Gen AI, I really mean ChatGPT or Google Bard, something along those lines. You might have a proprietary version in your organization. So the question is, how are you using it? Are you using it pretty much for everything at this point? Are you using it kind of daily when something specific comes up, maybe weekly when you think of it? maybe monthly, or maybe you only signed up or just got started on it uh, just today or recently, and maybe you're just not using it at all yet. So please just um, real quickly, just note your current usage, uh, and then we'll show the results for the group as a whole, just to kind of get a sense of where people are with this. Uh, and I know our, our uh, webinar uh, logistics manager, Brooke, behind the scenes is taking care of this. And there we go. We've got some great results. So only a few of you kind of using it for everything. I totally get that. We do have a, almost a quarter of you using it daily. Another quarter, uh, it, basically the rest of it distributed out by quarters as well, very closely. So I, it's really interesting to kind of see that and to get a sense of it. Um, I really had no idea what you were going to say. Um, but it looks like there's some people putting, dipping their toes in the water, and maybe today we'll give you an opportunity to kind of think a little bit more about that. So I'm going to close this up. Uh, thank you so much. And let's talk a little bit. So first, you may be asking, who on earth is this person? <laughs> so here's me. Um, I am adjunct faculty at the School of Business. I teach courses on entrepreneurship, strategy, and innovation. I've been a consultant for 30 years, focused on strategy and innovation for a lot of different kind of companies, big, small, every industry, all over the world. I'm an executive in residence at the University of Minnesota. I'm the lead executive uh, helping them spin out biotech companies. Um, and I've also co-founded uh, four different uh, ventures uh, in the life sciences space, spun out of university research. Uh, total exit value is just over $200 million. There's two of them still out there. Um, and my LinkedIn uh, link is at the bottom. I'll show you that again at the end. You're more than welcome to reach out to me and connect. 
Uh, here are some of the companies that I've helped start, some of the books and papers that I've written, which arguably nobody reads, which is my qualification as an academic. Uh, but you might be looking at all of this and saying, well, gee, Adam, that's really nice, but it kind of sounds like you're a more of a life science person. Um, so do you actually have a clue about any of this? Uh, and the short answer is sort of. Um, I am not an AI expert. Um, I, you know, I'm not actively involved in coding AI. I'm not doing that kind of work. Um, but here's where maybe this is helpful. I'm pretty knowledgeable about innovation adoption and business strategy. Um, I understand the aspects of competitive strategy at organizations and how they implement innovations and innovation policies. Um, now, I will say I actually do have a little bit of experience with neural networks and coding. This is a paper that some colleagues and I published a couple of years back in which we actually used a neural network to simulate organizational change. Um, and that was its own crazy experience uh, that we were working on for quite a long time. Um, but I'm definitely, and I do some Monte Carlo simulation work, but I, I'm not tr deep down like a coding person. It's not something I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I'm not you know, heavy into the theory of AI or anything like that. But I am having pretty active conversations with a dozen clients or so about AI use. And we're talking about every aspect of that, how they use it, what their policies are, what, how this links back to their business strategy. So hopefully this gives you a sense that while I'm not truly an AI expert, I'm kind of pretty immersed in it at this point. Um, and I'm hoping that over the course of these next half, this next half an hour or so, can show you a little bit of some of the things that we're seeing and that I'm encouraging clients to work on. And that might be a little eye-opening for you and maybe give you some thoughts and directions about your own organization's policies and activities specifically around Gen AI and, and, and tools like ChatGPT and BARD. So probably do need a word of caution before we dive into this. Um, you do need to remember that these large language models are trained almost entirely on publicly available information or in some cases pirated information. So you know what these things are you know going to spit back to you is only ba is based on what's out there. Um, and so there's going to be biases. Uh, the same way you get biases when you do any kind of online search, uh, or for example, what turns up in your Facebook feed or any other social uh, media feed that you might have. Um, with these large language models and Gen AI in general, there's, an, there's often a sense of that there's interpretation happening behind the scenes as if BARD or ChatGPT really understands what it's saying. And of course, you've seen news stories about people who think that these things are truly conscious and intelligent. I'm very skeptical about that. The way these large language models work uh, in a highly simplified way is that they're really good at figuring out what the next word in any given sentence should be. And so you give them a prompt, they track down a ton of information about it, and then they begin crafting sort of this text-driven response. Um, there's no evidence that there's understanding behind that. Bard doesn't understand what it's saying in any way that we think about consciousness. So please be careful about that because it is easy to over-attribute what's going on. And you do need to keep in mind the garbage in, garbage out situation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in just a couple of moments. All right. So we're not going to use chat GPT. Um, and for the very simple reason that I don't have a paid subscription to, to OpenAI. I do have a public account on OpenAI. Um, but as this points out, when I asked ChatGPT to compare itself to BARD, the response was, I have no idea what BARD is, because apparently it's not a thing. Um, uh, and that's because the, the free version of ChatGPT that's available has no updates since September of 2021. Um, if you're curious, you can open BARD and ask it to compare itself to ChatGPT, and BARD will give you a fairly compelling explanation of why it's better, which I thought was actually fairly funny. Um, but that's the only reason that we're going to talk. Uh, the, the stuff I'm going to do today is going to be with Bard, so you can see what that looks like. Um, ChatGPT, obviously an incredible innovation. I really started this whole thing. Um, I, I, it's just the version I have of it isn't updated. So, uh, And if you have a free version, your version is not updated either, uh, which you can check. Uh, and that might be uh, a particular reason you want to use Bard. If you have a Google account, you have a Bard account. Um, uh, it's included, uh, it's, it's just a part of the Google suite and you don't have to be paying for it. So, okay. So the first thing you need to know about Gen AI and business strategy is it's already out there. Um, this is something that early adopters have begun utilizing a lot of different ways. 
And you need to be aware of that. So for example, when you buy market reports, if you read business articles, if you look at consulting output or major data sets, whether publicly available or privately generated, even things like company social media posts and website content, whether that website content is real or fake, um, and anything that you're seeing around scenario generation, there is a pretty good chance that there's some AI behind it. Now, it might be subtle, um, and in some cases, it's not subtle. Uh, and so, for example, I fully believe that some of the market report text that you're seeing out there these days is AI generated because it's highly template oriented. Um, it's a collation of information. And the bottom line is it's pretty fast to use Gen AI to do stuff like that. Um, there's no question that Gen AI is being used to produce academic scientific articles, and there's an active discussion in the academic community right now about detecting them. Um, and there have been Gen AI generated articles that have been accepted for publication under false pretenses. Uh, and so this is an active thing. And so you do need to be cognizant of the fact that there's probably more out there than you're aware of and more content than you realize is probably being generated by Gen AI. So how do we put this in the context of business strategy? Well, so let's take a step back for a moment and just kind of think about what strategy is. Um, strategy is really a, a cascade of choices. Um, and this is taken from a book by, uh, called Playing to Win by uh, Roger Martin uh, and uh, A.G. Laffley. Uh, Laffley was the CEO of, of uh, Procter & Gamble. Roger Martin uh, former dean of the Toronto School of Business. Uh, I actually worked briefly with Mar uh, Roger at Monitor Company, which is Michael Porter's strategy company before it was bought by Deloitte. This is one of the great resources on what strategy is and how to implement it at your organization. Um, it really asks a whole a series of questions. What is winning? Where do we play? What are the trends that we're dealing with? How do we specifically beat competition? What capabilities do we need? And then what structures in the organization are required to manage, to leverage those capabilities such that we can actually successfully compete? Now, we're not possibly going to go through all the details on, on this. I've picked out a couple of things uh, that I think that Gen AI in particular can be really helpful with. Uh, but I'd encourage you to kind of step back and think about strategy in this competitive context. But what we're going to do here uh, could be used for almost any aspect of strategy in the organization, even if strategy is just around how you implement your, your role, your division, your group, whatever it happens to be. Uh, but obviously, since my a lot of my focus is on competitive strategy, that's where I've chosen to start. And that's where I do a lot of programming with CPED, uh, and we have a lot of companies come in. And so a lot of these examples are actually taken from uh a recent program that I gave on business strategy, where we were looking at a whole variety of industries and companies uh, and tackling some of these things. So let's dive into that and actually see what we can accomplish and uh, what we have to watch out for. So right off the bat, let's talk about SWOT, which is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Many of you probably use this tool at your organization. We played a little game at my last business strategy program where we asked our various teams to come up with a SWOT for an organization you may be familiar with called Culver's. And so here we have the results of that on the left, a group of four people got together and in about 10 to 15 minutes, they came up with a list of SWOT elements that they felt were relevant from a strategy perspective for Culver's. Well, that got me thinking, is that something that we could do from a Gen AI perspective? And so I asked Bard to come up with a SWOT for Culver's. And on the right, you can see what Bard came up with. And I've highlighted some of the things that were pretty much exactly the same. Um, some of the other areas of difference, you know, are always going to happen. I mean, not all of the team generated SWOTs look the same anyway. Um, but I found it fascinating just how close Bard came to what we generated. And it's pretty important to remember that this took 10 or 15 minutes of, you know, four people. Uh, it took Bard about six seconds to generate that. And so right off the bat, you should be thinking, huh, what are some of the things that we do from a strategy perspective that are intended to help us, you know, analyze situations that maybe Gen AI could be helpful on? Um, and further, you need to kind of ponder this a little more uh, in, in, with a little more depth because this is technically not the, quite the SWAT that 
Bard generated. Let me show you the SWAT that Bard generated. This is the SWAT that Bard actually generated. I simply took the little leading headers off of each one of its bullet points in order to fit it to the to the comparison slide. So now think about this. Um, what this is what Bard generated in six seconds in uh, in order to understand Culver's situation. Um, is this right? That's kind of not a helpful question to ask. Um, that because there's no there's not a definitive answer to a SWAT for an organization like Culver's. Um, all of this struck me as relevant. Um, I would not present this as part of a strategy presentation without noting that it was generated by Bard. And I'd go through it pretty carefully to say, gee, what do I know as a business strategy expert and maybe someone who's familiar with the fast food industry to think about you know, some subtleties that maybe would not be obvious. Um, but as a starting point, this is incredibly helpful. And obviously, given that it took Bard six seconds to do it, it's extremely efficient. All right, so let's take a look. Where can we go from there? So another example of this is to think about things like large scale trends from a strategic perspective. And so one of the other industries that we were talking about was the insurance space. And of course, one of the large insurers and employers here in the Madison area is American Family, a wonderful organization. And so I, after we had thought about some trend analysis, I went back to Bard and I said, tell me some large scale demographic trends that could negatively impact American family insurance. And sure enough, a few seconds later, Bard had some suggestions and they were all interesting. I mean, I think that they had some relevance. Um, you know, this is not rocket science per se, uh, but certainly given the efficiency of the system and uh, understanding uh, some of the specific elements of what's important with regard to insurance, uh, I think you can get a good start. Once again, though, uh, Jenny, I can sometimes surprise you. Uh, and so this is not actually Bard's total response. So I asked this question. I asked uh, Bard to come up with these trends. And Bard gave me these trends. Uh, but without prompting, it also suggested some things that American Family Insurance could do to mitigate the risks associated with those trends. I did not ask for that. That literally was just something Bard proposed on its own. The prompt was only what you saw on the prior slide. Tell me about some trends. And Bard said, I got some ideas for you. Uh, so here again, uh, and as I'll note in a little bit, sometimes Gen A can actually be quite surprising um, uh, in terms of how it understands the questions that we're asking or the demands that we're making of it and how it responds. Uh, again, is this right? No, I think that's the wrong question. Is this useful? I think this is incredibly useful. If I was starting out from zero uh, or I wanted to just kind of check to make sure that I was kind of get going on the right track, keep in mind, this is six seconds of work for Bard, right? And it's scouring a fair amount of information or to come up with it. I wouldn't present it as, you know, the definitive truth. But certainly as a starting point for thinking about trends and thinking about some of the challenges that an organization like American Family Insurance might face, this strikes me as an incredibly compelling place to begin. So beyond trends and beyond uh, and going now thinking a little more um, uh, beyond SWAT, maybe we're actually looking for new ideas and innovation opportunities. Um, one of the ways to think about this is that we're basically crowdsourcing without the crowd. So again, we were talking about the food industry at this point, uh, ingredients and food and snacks and things like that. And someone had uh, checked and I think discovered that the, uh, the people at Mars are making like 15 million Snickers bars a day or something like that, which struck me as almost inconceivable, but probably right. Uh, and so given that you've got, say, a product that's unbelievably, you know, um, popular, but there's stuff going on out there, right? So I didn't even ask uh, Bard to come up with the trends. I just said, assume, I figure Bard can figure out what the trends are. What new bars, what new Snickers bars, or what ways could this be adjusted in order to account for those trends? And so right off the bat, again, six seconds later, Bard's back with some ideas. Um, Plant-based proteins, whole grains, reduced sugar, functional ingredients. I That one caught me off guard. I was not prepared for that one. The international flavors one struck me as fairly entertaining, maybe a little, uh, maybe more entertaining than actually useful, but I don't know. I mean, this isn't my area. Uh, I don't do product management um, and I'm not an expert on ingredients. 
Uh, but it seemed to me that this is a really interesting conversation starter, right? And, you know, we do a lot of brainstorming in organizations and we're constantly trying to think about, you know, new opportunities and innovations for strategy. Um, and all right now, and all, now, unlike, you know, any time before, we have this tool available to us that is extensively proven. I mean, I, I'm not going to talk about OpenAI and Microsoft and, and ChatGPT, but I mean, BARD is from the people at Google. And so basically BARD is benefiting from Google's search experience and its access to the public web, right? And its ability to integrate that information extremely quickly. Um, so the idea, the issue is not that these are brand new ideas, right? It's not like BARD is probably going to potentially going to come up with something that we could patent um, or something that no one's ever thought of before. But as a starting point of ideas that maybe go beyond the way that we initially would have thought about one of these problems, it strikes me as a very interesting way to kind of take the box that we use for thinking and moving it over a little bit, right? Here's, you know, kind of here's what the crowd is saying out there. Um, it's not right per se, but it is really interesting and maybe provocative and maybe an opportunity for thinking about some strategic opportunities that we've not considered in the past. So you do have to be careful, right? So uh, one of the other areas that we were talking about was the white goods area, appliances. And uh, I, uh, we obviously have a fantastic organization called Sub-Zero uh, based here in Wisconsin, Northern Illinois. And so I just threw into Bard, hey, tell me the strengths and weaknesses of Sub-Zero. And I started looking at it and thought, cryomancy, that's an odd way to describe refrigeration. Uh, and then when we got to projectile attacks, I realized that probably I had done something wrong. And so as I read through the rest of it, I realized that we were not, in fact, talking about Sub-Zero. We were talking about Sub-Zero from Mortal Kombat, for those of you who perhaps remember the video game craze in the 80s and, and the subsequent hysterically bad movie, uh, but totally worth watching uh, uh, movie uh, that included as one of its characters Sub-Zero. Um, and so it, it is important to remember that because the information that Bard and ChatGPT rely on is the web, the web is more interested in Mortal Kombat than it is in, you know, Sub-Zero refrigerators. Uh, and so you do have to be cautious about the, the type of data that's coming in and the way that you actually ask questions. Now, as it turns out, uh, it isn't hard to fix this particular problem. Um, this is a one word fix, basically. In this case, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the company Sub-Zero. And the moment that you do that, Bard gets it and, and knows where you're headed with this and gives you some uh, interesting thoughts and things that you consider you can consider. But you can go beyond this fairly quickly to really recognize some of the power of having that sort of crowdsource, that capability beyond what we're currently working on, you know, what the information data sets that we have to the data that's out there more generally. And so here's an example in which I said, okay, so now we know the strengths and weaknesses of the company. What are its strategic goals? So I put that in. What are the strategic goals of the company Sub-Zero? And Bard gave me a really interesting uh, starting response, which is, hey, this is a privately held company. So technically it doesn't publicly disclose those. Bard's pointing out that if this were a public company, it could probably check the company's SEC reports. Uh, and those would they're required, they pretty much required to state what they say their strategic goals are. But what I thought was interesting was how Bard chose to interpret trying to answer this question based on its recent actions and investments. Now, that was not, I had not expected to see that particular phrase, but it did prompt me to think, wow, what could we do with this next, right? So um, the actual strategic priorities that Bard identifies here are relatively generic. But if we wanted to, what we can do is we can go back to Bard. And I didn't go and do this um, because all of this was happening in the context of uh, a, a separate program. But we could go back and start saying things like, Bard, where did you get this information from? Could you provide, could you provide some websites behind this? And the more specific you are, the more likely Bard and presumably ChatGPT are to actually give you something that, uh, that shows you where some of the information came from. I would love to know, for example, what some of the investments that Bard thinks Sub-Zero has made that suggest it's doing some of these things, uh, or which specific actions Bard is referencing, as it says, this is what we think Sub-Zero is doing. Keep in mind, this was done in six seconds, right? So if you were in the white good space and you wanted to know a little bit about what Sub-Zero is doing, how long would it take you or an analyst or a team to just get this started and to see where you might go? 
So hopefully you're beginning to get some ideas around this. You're getting some thoughts about some of the pros, some of the cons, some of the way to do this wrong. Uh, and hopefully you appreciate that uh, I showed you that one to emphasize that we're going to get this wrong sometimes and Bard's going to be wrong sometimes. And you do need to be aware that Bard makes mistakes. Both Bard and ChatGPT will totally make mistakes. I'll give you just a quick example that happened literally 20 minutes before this webinar. Um, I have some uh, travel plans to go out to California. I went into Bard. I asked it to put together an itinerary. And the first thing Bard told me was, well, it's 32 hours to drive to San Francisco, but luckily there's a direct flight from Madison. I'm like, there is no direct flight from Madison to San Francisco. And so I just said, Bard, you told me there's a direct flight from San Francisco to, to San Francisco from Madison, but in fact, there aren't. That's a mistake. Um, and Bard apologized, said, I'm sorry, I make mistakes sometimes. Um, and then it compounded the mistake by saying there are flights with one stop. Here's a bunch of them. And they were all flights from Chicago. And so I, I said, again, Bard, I appreciate your help, but those flights all appear to be from Chicago. And Bard apologized again and then gave me a list of flights from Madison to San Francisco that all had one stop. Um, and so it's kind of, you sort of have to learn how to interact with these systems. Um, and there are reasons that it's set up in a way to do this. Uh, and that you may have to kind of, uh, you have to sort of negotiate sometimes. Um, so as you think about that example around Sub-Zero and how quickly we could find out what some of its actions and strategic goals were, one of my questions for you is, what are your competitors learning about your organization from Gen AI? Anyone with a Google account has access to BARD. That's access to the full set of information that Google's capable of searching, right? Um, ChatGPT, presumably the same kind of thing, whichever one they happen to be using. If you're lucky, your competitors are using ChatGPT 3.5, which means they're not, anything they get's not more recent than September 2021. But uh, that, to me, is not a consolation. It does, would not make me feel particularly better. And so hopefully some of you are beginning to think about this uh, in some very specific ways, because this really does, in my opinion, change how we think about aspects of strategy, how we think about aspects of how we win and how our organizations actually operate. Here's, I want to try to bring a few thoughts together for you. So, okay, so Adam seems reasonably bright, but he's not really kind of in this space. Well, here's someone who's been in this space for a very long time. Maybe he's a little more trustworthy than Adam is. Um, maybe this is the biggest advance since the graphical user interface. Um, and Bill seems to think that this is pretty fundamental. But it's this last line uh, that he that he put, he added in that businesses will distinguish themselves by how well they use it. And if you don't walk away with anything else from today, maybe that's the sentence you need to walk away with. You need to remember that this is a tool. This is something we're going to use, and organ some organizations are going to use it well. Some organizations are going to use it poorly. And I agree with Bill. I think that this is not something where there's going to be a pause, right? I mean, you probably saw the news story where I think it was Elon Musk and some other people uh, suggested there should be a pause in AI development. It, I haven't heard a thing about that since. Um, and I, I, it's just not in the cards. And Congress is not going to regulate this in an effective way, in my opinion, anytime soon. Um, I'm not as concerned about the, you know, sort of the... Uh, um, apocalyptic visions for things like ChatGPT and BARD. I get it. There are concerns out there. I think it's appropriate for us to think about those issues. I do think there's a regulatory framework that will emerge maybe in five to 10 years, maybe longer, with regard to some of the more substantive challenges around AI and how it's used, especially in the context of things like um, uh, defense and personal information and policing and things like that. But from the business side, I, I don't think we're going to see a lot. Um, and you need to be aware of both the opportunities and the challenges that organizations are going to face with these kinds of tools out there. So let's do another quick poll. Brooke, could I ask you to put our next poll up, please? Um, so he, this is not asking you how much you're using it. This is asking you what the policies are at your organization. Uh, and again, this is totally anonymous. I would be very grateful uh, if you would just share this, provide your best understanding of the of how, what is the policy for Gen AI at your organization? Is it, everyone has a license to use it? Like everybody is licensed to use ChatGPT 4.0 or the company has Google Suite and everybody has Bard. Um, maybe it's licensed or approved for some groups. Um, 
maybe marketing, for example, for social, generating social media posts, but there's no policy for anyone else. Um, maybe it's licensed and approved for some groups, but banned for everybody else. Um, maybe it's banned for everyone. Uh, maybe you have the classic don't ask, don't tell policy. Maybe there's no policy, or maybe it's something that I couldn't even come up with here. So please do quickly share. We're not tracking who you are. We are not tracking your, your response. We just want to be able to kind of show everyone where companies are in thinking about this. Um, so please take a moment. Uh, please do vote. We really appreciate if you do this. It is 100% anonymous. We do not track this in any way, shape, or form. Um, and I know Brooke will uh, kind of shift us over to the responses as soon as we've gotten to a, a reasonable amount. If we're struggling to uh, get uh, up to a reasonable number, Brooke, let me know and I'll see if I can exhort people. Okay, so here we go. We got a fair number of people who participated. And that's, this is what I expected, which is roughly half the companies out there have no policy. That is the case with most of the clients that I am working with right now. Um, and I am fascinated to see that the, the companies who do have some sort of policy are all over the place, right? Um, so the good news is this is everyone. Everyone is struggling with this. No, Very few companies have really clear policies around this. It's a very small majority that have license used for everyone. Um, but this, I think, is where the part of, a big part of the challenge really is. Um, I, I think that we have to recognize that it's not just as simple uh, as what the underlying technology can do. It's also a broader set of questions that we're going to have to address at some point in time. So, for example, here's how I'm starting to think about this. We actually have to think about it from both a use and a feeding perspective. And I think every organization, and I'm including not-for-profits, I'm including government organizations, I'm including the university. Trust me, we are already fighting some of these battles at the university. Don't even get me started on that. Um, but we are going to have to have policies around this and procedures and thoughts on how this stuff gets used. And so on the use side, which I'm calling offense, um, we need to figure out how to provide licensed access with guidance on confidentiality and security. Remember, everything you type into BARD technically belongs to BARD, um, and you can accidentally disclose information that you really should not be disclosing. Um, clearly, we should be encouraging people to use this for net value positive activities, and I would categorize those simply as things like activities where there's a really low cost of being wrong, or we're really talking about high volume and time uh, intensity. Asking Bard to do a SWOT analysis to get a to start a discussion at the uh, for a strategy meeting that sounds like a brilliant way to get the conversation going without having everybody kind of have to go up to easels and do 15 minutes on their own only to have a whole bunch of different SWATs that people don't actually agree on. Um, using something like using a Gen AI system for market and customer scanning strikes me as almost so obvious that everybody should be doing it. Competitor scanning absolutely. I mean, that's really where, you know, this becomes a little uh, fairly powerful is kind of being aware of what our competitors are up to all the time. And then idea and opportunity generation, Bard, and at, le I, at least Bard, I haven't played with ChatGPT as much. Bard's pretty good with just throwing ideas against the wall. Like if you say to Bard, come up with 20 ideas to do the following, Bard will do its best. And some of it's awful, but some of it's actually quite interesting. Um, and a lot depends on obviously how you phrase it. But we also have to look at the other side, this issue of feeding, right? This is defense because everything we put out there in the public becomes food for BARD or chat GPT as the case may be. So at some point, we're going to have to start thinking about this. Do we need to be more careful on how we control public disclosure of events and intentions? Clearly, public companies have responsibilities, legal responsibilities to disclose certain information in quarterly reports, 10Ks, things like that. Can't get out of that. But we're going to have to start thinking about what we say in those kinds of reports, not just because people may review it, but because there's a system now behind the scenes that's quite capable of integrating that information incredibly rapidly and looking for patterns. This company has made four acquisitions in five years moving in this space towards full vertical integration. That might not have been obvious to a person kind of trawling through these 100 page reports, but an entity like Bard can quickly spot those kinds of things. Clear policies on social media posting by all parts of the organization. I mean, I'm still shocked by how many organizations don't have clear policies on social media posting, but this is about to be, need to go to a completely different level because now there's uh, these systems out there that can quickly integrate all of that information, whether it's going to Twitter, whether it's going to Facebook, whether it's going to onto the website, whether, you know, wherever that information is going on social media, 
um, it's going to be accessible and it's going to be able to be integrated incredibly rapidly. And this in some ways is going to become a little like cybersecurity. We're going to need things like uh, white hat scanning of organization strategy initiatives. Some of you have probably, maybe a couple of you have actually pulled open BART or chat GPT and done a quick question about your own organizations already, like do a SWAT for my organization. That can be really revealing, right? Or, you know, what are my organization's strategic goals or what kinds of opportunities are there for my organization in the following spaces or sectors? Um, if we can ask those questions, our competitors can ask those questions. And if we are fail to ask those questions, our competitors may be asking those questions anyway. And so this is one of those things where uh, ignorance is not, <laughs> is not bliss. Uh, ignorance is not your best policy. Uh, this is something where there's going to need to be some hard conversations inside the organization, uh, especially in more competitive sectors or sectors where there's a lot of exogenous change being generated by large scale trends, other factors, regulation, uh, whatever it happens to be. Here's what I think. I think AI is a fundamentally different innovation from almost everything else. And I'll tell you, when we did our own little neural network programming on organizational structure, I was shocked. And I want to put some context around that. We used an 11 node neural network to successfully predict an organizational structural change. And in fact, the network then generated additional um, outcomes that we hadn't thought of, but we realized actually were quite relevant and possible. Um, that was an 11 node neural network. Google Bard is a 570 billion node neural network, right? And so here's the thing, even the people who are developing this stuff do not fully understand how it works or what it's capable of doing. These things are to some extent black boxes. Again, I do not believe there's consciousness there. I don't believe there's understanding in the way we think about understanding in a philosophical sense but we can't fully predict exactly what these kinds of uh, models are capable of doing. And that's partly because its capability is cumulative rather than linear. linear. It's learning as it goes along. It's becoming better at under, not understanding, but at adapting to what kind of information is useful versus what's not useful, what's factually correct, what isn't factually correct. Um, and so what that means is that in many ways, its, fu it's future capability may or perhaps will not be predictable based on current capability. And that has a very specific implication that the implication from that is that if you aren't kind of getting in connected with this and beginning to think about what it does and how it does it, the longer you wait, the further behind you will be because uh, we're never going to, I think we're never going to fully understand at like a deterministic level how how these neural networks actually reach the things that they do. And you only have to look at, for example, the success of neural network driven chess engines to see how this happened. And I, I know that's very geeky and way beyond anything in this conversation, but uh, neural networks have completely taken over computer chess engines. All the best ones in the world are neural networks now. And they come up with games and policies that grandmasters have never predicted. Um, there, there's no competition anymore between computer chess engines and humans. Um, it's not worth it. Uh, there's just no, no possibility that humans can win those battles against the top chess engines anymore. Um, and you need to kind of think about that from a business perspective. Like, what does that mean in terms of the neural networks that are generating information that could be leveraged for business strategy? Um, and it should be something you you know, on the one hand makes you a little concerned. And on the other, it's also something where you probably want to try to think about it as an opportunity because ultimately it is a tool. It's a complex, weird, and a little frightening tool, but it's ultimately a business tool like almost any other tool that uh, we would want to talk about. So I'm pretty much happy to kind of uh, wrap this up, but of course I have to give Bard the last word. What's Bard's opinion on all of this? Well, I asked Bard, how should companies use Bard to explore, develop, and implement business strategy? And sure enough, Bard had an answer for me, right? So here are some of the ways that it suggested uh, that you could potentially use this, exploring new market opportunities, building new business models, implementing new strategies. Those are pretty generic. Um, but once again, don't count out the Gen AI system too quickly because this isn't Bard's whole response. The prompt is at the top. Bard came up with this, and then it tacked on the following 
Here are some specific examples, and it identified ways that a consumer goods company could use social media data, a tech company could generate ideas, a retail company could implement and monitor a marketing campaign. Um, so I didn't ask for that, but Bard provided it anyway. And so hopefully you're really beginning to see sort of um, the challenge of both understanding how these systems work and thinking about the ways that they could be uh, they could be utilized from a business strategy perspective. So with that, I'm going to close things up. Here's my disclaimer. No humans or artificial intelligences were harmed in the making of this webinar. I am giving you BARD's official disclaimer just because I use BARD extensively here and it is a free service. I want to make sure that I note BARD's disclaimer that it may display inaccurate or offensive information that doesn't represent Google's views. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jeremiah. Awesome. Great stuff. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, before we get to our question and answer period, I just wanted to let our attendees know about CPED's newest offering. It's uh, AI coaching packages with Dr. Bach. Uh, as you heard today, this uh, the speed of change in today's business landscape is really unprecedented. And we as business leaders um, need to uh, need to keep up with that speed of change and um and the 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 challenges that you face uh, require unique solutions so adam shared his expertise and guidance on the game changing impact of ai and business strategy now is the chance for you to ensure that you are equipped to lead this change so cped and dr bach have partnered to provide three attendees of today's webinar with the opportunity to choose from two options of exclusive AI coaching packages. So for rapid grounding and focus, choose the nine hour coaching package, or for a deeper dive into personal growth and strategic leadership, our 12 hour package is available. Remember, investing in coaching isn't just about uh, an investment in skills. It's an investment in you and your organization's future. Stand out lead with confidence, and seize the tools to navigate the complexity of the AI and business strategy. I suggest you go to uh, our website, go.wisc.edu slash AI dash coaching to select your package and begin your transform transformative journey with Dr. Bach. Um, with that, uh, we can jump into our Q&A session again. If uh, you do have any questions, please feel free to drop those into the Q and A uh, section of our uh, of your Zoom tab there at the bottom, or drop those into the chat. Um, let me go ahead and uh, grab some of our questions here, Adam. So um, here we have a, a question in regards to obstacles with adoption of Gen AI. Um, is it trust, accuracy? What are some of the factors that might accelerate its usage and implementation in, in, uh, in business? Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. And it's it's one that we talk about extensively in the context of innovation generally at organizations. Um, and there's a hard reality to innovation adoption, which is that people don't adopt technologies because they're better. Uh, they don't adopt technologies because they're cool. They adopt those technologies because it benefits them in some way. And the that benefit outweighs their perceived cost associated with adoption. Um, and so the challenge, I think, in the context of the organization more generally is, one, that there's policies at the organization level that make it clear what is and is not acceptable use. Um, you've already heard me say, I think the only way you can get up to speed on this is to play with it and experiment with it. So I'm, I'm worried when I run into companies who have already banned their use. I know why they're doing it. They're doing it because of concerns about security. They're worried about, they're worried about issues of confidentiality, but banning it isn't going to prevent people from using it. It just prevents people from ultimately learning to use it in an effective way in the organization. So on the adoption side, there have to be mechanisms to help people overcome that person for, because for some people they're just going to play with it then there are people who are you know genuinely nervous about it genuinely afraid of it genuinely concerned that you know oh if i start using it now it's going to come back and haunt me later 
Um, and the truth of the matter is, is I think you can only overcome those um, by giving people a safe space to try it out. Uh, and the, the good news is that there's lots of easy ways to do it. Um, I was chatting with uh, our administrator right before this webinar talking about getting uh, Bard started. And she said, oh, I just went to Bard and asked it what I should have for dinner. And oh my gosh, it has like three different interesting suggestions. One of them actually looks pretty good. And that's the thing is like, we've got to recognize that you start with the easier stuff that people are more comfortable with. And then you can eventually get to the kinds of actual usage um, that's going to be valuable. So you've got you. So you do have to one make sure there's a policy to so that use is appropriate, and then two on the adoption side, you do have to overcome people's perceptions around what it really does, and give them that sense that they can make a small investment in it, very small, right? Because people are worried I have to spend a lot of time on this. They don't. Uh, and if they can make that small time investment and get something out of it that benefits them, that's when they'll embrace an adoption and they'll learn to use it uh, effectively inside the organization. Thank you, Adam. Um, we've got some uh, additional questions here. And I, I kind of got a kick out of this one. How do you deal with the plagiarism when students or others use these AI sources. Yeah, well, everybody has a different opinion about that. I, I, I was hoping we wouldn't talk about this, but I guess since it's been asked, I'll, I'll at least explain sort of the university's policy and my own policy, which are actually a little bit different. Um, so the university's policy is that, uh, well, I guess they're not different because the university's policy is that instructors should figure it out for themselves for all practical purposes. Clearly, anything that's true plagiarism is a problem. And there are, on, you know, part of our online system has mechanisms to look for plagiarism. There is an AI detector built into uh, platforms like Canvas now. Those detectors are, you know, they're getting a lot better, um, but this is an arms war and we all know which way those tend to go. Um, my own perspective on it is that I, I don't, I, I think that we really have to look at it from the other direction. And so in my courses, the way I've approached it is um, that students are totally allowed to use any of these AI systems in a very specific way. And so the instructions on my assignments say the following, if you use AI, you need to provide the prompt that you gave the AI system. You have to copy and paste the full response that came back from the AI system. And then you make your submission, which is the edited or a, you know integrated or whatever you know, version of that. Um, and, and the con, you know, and so the, the question is: do students just copy paste AI output anyway? Yeah, of course. Some students do. And sometimes the detection catches them. And if they do, that can be a considered a serious offense in the organization. And so my policy is designed to say, look, just don't do that. All you have to do is just show you've learned something, do something better, you know, use the AI as a tool, treat it like Excel or like a calculator or whatever, right? Um, because if they're doing that, then they're still learning. And, and that's how I see it in organizations as well. Like I said, don't have Bard do your SWAT and then just throw it up onto a screen as if you did it. Say it was Bard's <laughs> and then maybe point out a couple things that really bear a little more uh, a little more careful consideration. The trick is to think that it's a tool, right? Remember that it's a tool. There were times, there were people who said we would never let cal kids use calculators in school. I think we're past that now. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And I, I just want to remind everybody, we do have about 12 minutes left. So we have plenty of time for questions. If you if you do have a question, feel free to type it into the question and answer uh, box. Uh, and thank you, Adam, for sticking around and, um, and answering these questions for us. Uh, what are Adam, what are the best demonstrated ways to incorporate AI into the strategies of companies? Yeah, so that's awesome. So before I, I dig into that a little bit, I want to point out that I did tell some of my students about this webinar, and I can see at least one of them is here showing me up. Um, so in chat, there is a link from one of my awesome students, Are you? and I told them to show me up. I told them, please come and fix what I say wrong. And so he, I, A plus for Aryush, in the chat box, there is a link that Aryush has provided on that outlines what these models are good at. So I encourage you, uh, maybe take Aryush up on that. Um, I And I, I'm so grateful that, uh, that Aryush came to the session. I don't know, I can't check and see if... Um, 
Uh, he's got some other comments in there, and there's probably other comments from my other students as well. Um, they're more sophisticated than I am. So I anything that's in the chat from one of my students, please take it as being uh, an improvement on anything that I said. Um, so in the context of then ap applying this into business strategy, I, I think it's really very straightforward. Um, your organization should have some kind of strategic planning process. Your group or division probably has activities that it does on a regular basis around where are we going? Like, where are we trying to, where are we trying to get to? Are we trying to become number one in the industry? Is my division simply trying to become 10% more efficient? Um, are we trying to reposition this product? And presumably in that you have a plan, you have some kind of plan, depending on, you know, how bureaucratic your organization is versus how entrepreneurial your organization is, but there's probably a plan with a series of steps. And in those steps, there's information that you are taking account of, right? For example, where is the market going? What are the big trends that are coming that are playing out? What are our competitors doing? Um, what have we been trying to do for the last couple of years? What are the capabilities that we bring to bear? Um, and in, those are the opportunities where right off the bat, it's really powerful to bring one of these Gen AI systems in because they're going to have access to all the information, publicly available information you have access to, but they're capable of integrating a lot faster. Now, once you go beyond the public Gen AI side of this, now we can talk about sort of custom systems. I'm not saying you should go and give IBM a couple million dollars in order to start using Watson. I mean, for most companies, that's really probably, you know, most medium-sized companies and even many big companies, that's probably out of reach. Um, although you keep in mind, over time, as these systems become better, you know, the marginal cost drops as with all of things in software. And over time, those things will become more and more accessible. But there are tools out there that are designed to not just evaluate the outside data, but to help you evaluate the inside data, to look at things inside your organization, to start thinking about which capabilities are you lacking, to start thinking about where there are strengths that are maybe not being used inside the organization, people with capabilities, people with time, uh, people with ideas. Um, and all of those are, that gets to a much more complex and customized layer of business strategy. Um, and that's really kind of where the, you know this this space is going to go in the next five to ten years. Um, and there'll be an endless number of companies that can help you with this that are you know constantly advertising the use of AI. I, I remember hearing this ad on NPR all the time uh, during All Things Considered. Um, this AI system, you know, answering business questions that you know we never could answer before. And I that might be true. I, I suspect that what it really was is we couldn't answer them before because it just took too long and it cost too much. And now we can do it relatively inexpensively. At the same time, we have to remember that those systems don't understand anything. They're not conscious. They're not capable of thought the way we think about it. And so they, that kind of stuff still needs to be checked. And so this stuff isn't going to eliminate the role of the strategic planner at the company, but it should augment and complement the kinds of strategic work that's being done at organizations. Um, and there's no question in my mind that the big consulting firms are using these tools as ways of uh, uh, building and developing what, they, uh, what they're offering to their clients. Um, and as is always the case with this kind of stuff around business consulting capabilities, it's stuff that companies can do themselves if they start making investments. And the advantage here is that this stuff is, you know, at least at the beginning, uh, the Gen AI stuff is free or cheap to use. Um, and in all of those situations, you know, obviously you have to be careful about what you ask it and you have to be thoughtful about how you prioritize how you're using it. But surely there's activities that it can do dramatically faster, just as efficiently, if not more efficiently, uh, than you've got people doing work. Um, so rather than think about, can we use this to like put people out of work? I would say, can we use this to augment the work that people are doing already? Because I think that that's where it's really powerful. So Adam, with that said, would you expect to see AI departments or like a chief AI officer attached to strategy departments and some companies in the near future? So that's a great question. I'll give you my favorite answer, which is, I don't know. Um, I think it's a little early to be sure about that kind of thing. Um, my own opinion is there's no doubt that people in organizations are going to get smart at this. Just like with every other function, just like with every other aspect of an organization, there are going to be people who are more or less competent with regard to this kind of using these kinds of tools. Um, whether that ultimately ends up getting consolidated into an AI office, an AI manager, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, 
We've seen that with things like chief innovation officers, chief information officers. Um, so it's certainly possible. I mean, the trend towards that kind of specialization is there. Um, you want my personal opinion in the matter, um, which I'll offer you whether you really want it or not. I'm not really sure that that's in everyone's best interest. Yeah, there definitely need to be policies. I, I, I got to just say there have to be policies around this. But whether there should be like a concentrated centralized area in the organization, this strikes me as something where, you know, maybe we do need a few people who are kind of a little more familiar with this. But this capability is going to need to live everywhere in the organization. Like this isn't going to be something where, you know, only the marketing department and the chief executive officers use ChatGPT. That's just asking for trouble, right? I mean, it's just not, in my opinion, that's not a vibe. That'd be like saying only the people in the executive office get to use Excel. Um, only the marketing people get to use the CRM. Like it's just anytime you silo and compartmentalize like that, I think you're asking for trouble. And this is such a general tool um, it's, this is not a functional tool. This is not, you know, accounting software. It's not, you know, um, it's not like bases, you know, the marketing, uh, market trending, uh, market trend analysis stuff. This is totally general software. It is capable of tackling almost anything. Uh, and so I think that they're, they're the more likely reality is that it, the companies that are getting engaged in it and advanced in it are going to tackle it on an organization-wide basis relatively quickly from the operations manufacturing floor to the marketing department, to the finance department, to the executive office, to the strategy development team, to the coders. Um, I think that this is something that there's going to need to, there's, we're going to see widespread use across organizations. And here's another uh, of my students, Harrison. Awesome, Harrison has put a couple of more useful. I love my students. Mm -hmm. um, I rely on them to correct me because I, I, I make a lot of mistakes. Um, they've got some really interesting suggestions on here, some YouTube videos. So I really encourage you, if you're still, I, I see we're losing people, which is normal and that's fine. But uh, if you've been following the chat, you're seeing my students put good ideas up there and they're doing this knowing they're not going to get any points for it, by the way. Uh, but uh, <laughs> um, but they're, they're, my, there they are. And, and this is the thing you got to watch. I, I want you to be aware of, right? Like, think about this. This is a young technology. And the, you know, the, the people who are using this are heavily slanted towards the younger generation because they don't have those inbred biases about what to do with it. Like they don't care. They just log on to it and they start playing with it. Right. Um, so keep that in mind in the context of your organizations, um, who's using it and who's not using it. And I, I want to get to this one last question here. Um, and it, it's, it's, a. Uh, rather an interesting perspective. So do you see Gen AI becoming more commercialized in the future? Um, the the uh, question brings up the example um, when you type in asking about uh, a trip to California, it comes back with, well, while you're in California, enjoy a Coke and go to Chipotle in An Anaheim. Uh, any thoughts on, on how the commercialization of AI might happen? Sure. Might I mean, Google and Microsoft happen to be for-profit companies. Um, I, I don't know that there's any way around that. I, I think right now, much of that is probably incidental. So for example, when I put in my California trip, which Bard incorrectly told me I could fly directly from Madison to San Francisco, it did suggest a couple of like places to go, right? And one of them was go see, you know, the, here's a beach that's really cool. This is the big museum in the city you're talking about. I mean, that's what you would find from like a tourist website. And I didn't think it was this overly commercial. Um, but I mean, you, if you think about it, you know where this is going, right? Where it's going is Bard will eventually say there will probably be a sidebar with links to things that you can do in that area, you know, local businesses. And Bard will say, do you want information about the following, right? And some of those will be paid, right? I mean, this is the next, um, this will be the next iteration um, of ad sets, right? I mean, there's really no way around this uh, because that's, you know, Google doesn't make its money on search and it doesn't sound like it's planning to make its money on BARD. It's going to make its money on advertising. So, so the short answer is, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's just, there's really just no way around that. Um, how pervasive, extensive it is, I'm probably, again, I'm not an ad advertising person fundamentally, but I mean, I think you just have to look at the evolution of the search page, right? Do you remember when the Google page had no ads on it? Uh, we all remember those days when Facebook had no ads, um, when LinkedIn had no ads. 
Um, I mean, this is the core business model for the web um, and for apps. So, you know, will there be paid solutions where you get out of that, where you get around that? Sure. Is that what people want? It doesn't appear to be the case. People seem happy to see advertising. And yeah, sometimes, it's, you know, it's useful. I mean, that's the theory of advertising anyway. So, yeah, it's it's 100 percent going to have to be commercial. And the and the short term, I think we know where it's going. Yeah. Well, uh, excellent. Thank you so much, Adam. We really appreciate you stopping by and sharing your expertise with us today. Um, on behalf of everybody here at the Center for Professional and Executive Development, we'd like to invite all of our attendees to uh, to sign up for an AI coaching opportunity with Adam. If you uh, go to our website, uh, go.wisc.edu slash AI dash coaching uh, to get more information about that. Until next time, thank you and be well.